chapter 2, verse 8, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. So we see there that it's by grace that we've been saved. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, it says, Who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, uh, not to the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. And one of the things that a lot of our brothers and sisters are having a challenge with is the grace message, is the grace of God. Because when we read, uh, if we try to take the whole Bible, talking about the Old Testament and New Testament, as the Word of God now present and relevant, there's a lot of contradictions because God is seen in a different uh, contradictory, contradictory way. When that Old Testament was, was written, it was a whole different time, a whole different world, where they had to do with wars and, and different kingdoms warring against each other and persecutions and so forth and so on. And they each had their own God that they believed in and whatever God conquered their particular nation and that nation would have to worship that God and the most fearful God is the God you should fear. And they had stories about God having wars in the heavens and uh, the heavens being split and just on and on and on and on and on with this angry warring God. And there was a lot of things that happened, our stories that happened, that's recorded in the Old Testament that there's no um, um, record of except in the Bible. I'm not saying it didn't happen. I'm just saying the only recorded data that you have is the Bible. There's no archaeological find. There's anybody during those times and during that period that was actually writing history or recording things that happened in history. A lot of the things that we have in the Old Testament is not recorded. So, uh, so then you look at it. Well, this was a, this had a story to it. These stories had a truth that God was uh, displaying to the people at that particular time. But then we move into Christ and His appearing and His coming. And for me, I always tell this to everybody that listens to me. I am a person that says it is finished. I don't look beyond anything. Uh, or any scripture that is given that is not seasoned or has a thread of love in it. So whenever I read scripture, old or new, the the under, the um, the undergirding truth of those scriptures is love, grace, and forgiveness. That brings you in the right balance of what that scripture is trying to say. It also gives you the uh, spirit that God is trying to relay through the messenger. So Jesus came to bring us grace and truth amen so let's read first john chapter 17 i mean chapter 1 again verse 17 it says for the law uh, was given through moses but grace and truth came through jesus christ grace and truth came through jesus christ amen okay uh, <clears throat> excuse me no one has seen god at any time the only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father he has declared him to us. So if you want to know about God, you will know uh, about God through what Jesus, who's in the bosom of God, declares about God. So you see the real face of God, and you see the real relationship that man has with God, okay? Now, I also made mention last week, and, the, and for the people who were uh, listening to me on the first time, because they tuned us in, um, it was the first time he was able to listen to us. I made mention of A Course in Miracles. I made mention of A Course in Miracles written by Helen Schuchman. And the reason I said that is because I have some information that I need to share with you uh, today. Um, through my research, the Bible itself is not man a manuscript written by the authentic authors. The Bible is, is, is all the Bible from Genesis to Revelation has to do with copies. It's not the original manuscript. The author that wrote those books, are not. Are, those are not their words. Because the original manus manuscripts was destroyed because of the material it was written on, time, it aged, it crumbled, it turned to dust. So a lot of people rewrote the Bible based on <clears throat> uh, memory, okay, of what those original scriptures said, <clears throat> or they copied the original scriptures. Well, here you have a problem of error, especially if someone is copying something that's, that's handwritten. Because if your eyeballs skip a line 
or miss a word, it has a whole different meaning. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's that's the challenge of the Bible. Now, I believe in the Bible. I will quote the Bible today in this message. Uh, I believe in prayer. I believe being filled in the Holy Spirit. I speak in tongues, the whole nine yards. But I'm just telling you that those are those are the reasons that you may find some error in the Bible because of it being copied. Okay, they did not have the technology we have today. They did not have. Um, they couldn't make the manuscripts last for centuries as we can make manuscripts last for centuries. The material that they use. Uh, would degrade and disintegrate that they wrote on. There's a lot of things that was going against the original uh, writings of the Bible lasting for over 2,000 years. Uh, next, uh, the next thing that I want to make, make mention of uh, when it comes to that is Helen Shookman. Well, Helen Shookman heard the voice that identified himself as Christ. She didn't do anything but write what the voice of Christ said. When I was reading her book, I saw in there some parallels to what is in scripture that Jesus said. And there was so much parallel in, in that writing that sounded like the voice of Christ. And because she was an atheist, she was not a Christian. She did not know the scriptures. She did not know the Bible. It became more of a pure translation of the actual voice of Christ. She had no, no incentive to write these words. <clears throat> there was nobody she was trying to uh, get to follow her. There was no movement she was trying to back or, or substantiate. So she was just writing what the Spirit was saying to her, which identified itself as Christ. That is the closest thing to the voice of Christ that we have 2,000 years, over 2,000 years after his death, burial, and resurrection. So I follow that. And then I discovered some other books because of Cap Constantinople and, I mean, Constantine and, and some other uh, um, uh, uh, fathers, Christian fathers, father, they, they left some books out of the Bible. And when I discovered those books and the sayings of Christ, they were very close to the sayings that, that Helen said that Christ said to her and give you a, a more authentic reality of what the heart of Christ is all about. And it's really about being one with God. And it's really about um, the illusion of being separated from God, which exists in our mind. And then we have been teaching ourselves over, the, over, our, over our faith walk for years that we are not a body. We might not have said it that way, but what we said was, I am a spirit. I have a soul. I live in a body. So that lets me know I'm not a body. I live in a body, but I'm not a body. I am a spirit. I have a soul. I live in the body. And the word of God tells us that we are working out our own soul salvation. We're working out our soul salvation, which tells me that my body is, that I'm living in now is not saved. So I cannot contact God because the things of this body, the sensories, the the consciousness of this of this world does not connect me with the unseen world or with God. So if I'm going to um, follow God as a child of God, which I am, I have to do that by faith. I have to do that by revelation that the Spirit of God gives to me, and I'll walk by faith and not by our, my senses. And so that's basically where we are. So there's a lot of things that's going on where people are looking to the Bible to try to explain what's happening in the world today, especially with this COVID-19. Is this a plague? Is this a virus? Is this the judgment of God? Is God, God done shut down the nightclubs and the restaurants and God is judging all the evil people of the world? Well, I'm very good on reading the scriptures and the copies of scriptures. When I look at the plague that we see in the Bible and people trying to make a comparison, a contrast of, the plagues that was uh, that was on Egypt to set the people of God free. It never covered our, the property of, of the Hebrew nation. None of their cattle, none of their land, not, not anybody that was identified as a child of God, their house, nor none of that was affected by the plague. But in this virus, there are the, the there are those who are saved, those who worship God, filled with the Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in tongues been afflicted by this virus and dying. So it, so God is just, he's the same. That story is a story, but if I thought it was true, I can see in this difference that's happening that this could not be of God. 
if God was doing this and he was separating people, it would be a fine separation and no one who was saved would be lost. And all the world that's lost would be the only one suffering. That's not it. What this virus is saying to us, that this, this global <clears throat> reality is a, is a community. The, the, the whole world is a community. It's one community. And it talks about the oneness of God and how we are one people, though we have different political stands and different emphasis on, on, on our politics, on how we should live and in our culture. This virus is attacking every line. It's crossing every line, no matter what your religion is, no matter what your political beliefs are, it does, it, no matter what color skin you have, this virus is attacking and killing people. This is not the will of God. This is not a judgment of God because that would make God unjust. And that is, this, is, this is not what's going on. This is um, uh, our responsibility, and God has given us spiritual insight on how to handle these kind of things if we walk by wisdom that he's given us in Christ Jesus and not by fear. We are not to operate by fear. We are to operate by faith. And we who are the spiritual practitioners who are strong in faith, if we gather one word outside of fear, outside of judgment, because God is not judging anybody, there's now no condemnation. There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And that's not saying that there are those outside of Christ. It's just saying that there are those who are conscious that they're in Christ. All of humanity has been saved and, and placed back in Christ. All of humanity has the Holy Spirit, but not all of humanity has that consciousness or awareness of that truth. For those of us who are aware of that, we are to intercede and pray for our brothers and sisters who are not aware of that and, and to help them move from this darkness into the light of God. That's just a simple ex explanation about what we're teaching. And in, in Hebrews, and for those who think that this is a new, uh, I'm a new age teacher, it says here in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 7 and 8, it says, uh, for it, <clears throat> for if that the first covenant, that's the covenant of Moses, if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second because finding fault with them, he says, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will uh, take make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And then 8.13 says, Hebrews 8.13 says, in that he says, a new covenant he has made the first obsolete. Now that now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. And the only thing that and the only one's keeping that old from vanishing away is us, because we keep restirring the pot. Let it go, let it go, and let the life and the wisdom of Christ rule and direct your thinking and your perception. In Second Corinthians chapter three. Verse six, it says, who also made us, you know, like people saying, well, we don't need, we have the Holy Spirit. I don't need anybody to teach me anything. Well, that's true. You should get there eventually. <clears throat> but until you get there, he has also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. So anything that is killing, God does not kill. He does not use his word to kill, maim, or destroy. In fact, God doesn't even defend himself because the truth does not need to be defended. It is what it is. It is truth. You accept it and be blessed by it or you reject it and miss out on all the benefits of walking and living by it. It does not have to defend itself. You will come to the end of your own confusion and insanity and come back to the truth it remains as it was when you first met it. It doesn't have to change itself, but the truth itself is transformative. And one of the things that we've done and heard in the past, we preached living a life that is worthy and righteous so that we can get to heaven. Well, we find now through wisdom that heaven is not a place you go to. Heaven is a place you live from. I want to say that again. Heaven is not a place that you go to. Heaven is the place that you live from. We live from heaven. And it's, and it's the righteousness that God is at work. It's his righteousness that he's working in us. It's his work, righteousness that he's working in us. 
It's his righteousness that he's working in us. We're not his righteousness like I'm, I'm, I've got to do things right. No, he's working his righteousness in us. And his righteousness that he's working in us is the righteousness that we have become. So we're not looking at the outside, outside behavior and outside uh, uh, um, uh, activity to justify who we are. We have been transformed and born again. So our being dictates our behavior and our awareness of our being will dictate our behavior as well as our outlook and our perception. So once our awareness and our identity has changed, our behavior changes, our outlook on life changes, the power that God has given to us, it is more available to us because now we're walking, not, not in the egoic mindset, but in the mindset of Christ. We have one mind with him. We have one mind with him. We don't walk and operate from fear. We walk and operate from the power that is work in us. For greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Now, I want to make a quick reference to Genesis uh, chapter 3. And in that reference, in that reference, Adam and Eve had decided to set up a government on the planet of good and evil. And so God is prophetically talking to them. Well, now that you can set this on the planet, these are the things that happen because you choose to live a life that, ha that is binary, good and evil, right and wrong, up and down. And he begins to talk to them about what this life look, will look like. He begins to prophesy to them. And basically, evil is not just deeds. Evil is just not uh, acts that you do, like burning people alive or, <clears throat> or, or killing millions of people. That is evil, but that is not just that. E the root word for evil means hard or hardship. And when you talk, when you read, when you listen to what God says in that story about Adam, he's talking about things now are going to come to you hard. By the sweat of your brow, you're going to labor. The whole earth is going to be contrary to your good work. And you're going to put some good work in there. You're going to get thorns and thistles from the labor that you put out there. There's going to be a resistance because, because you determined that you want to know the opposite of good. And the opposite of good is not a blessing. The opposite of good is hardship. So when you when you read Genesis, it's, you know, it's a, uh, and then to Adam he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten... From the tree which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat, um, cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles. Uh, it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you uh, were taken, for dust you are in and to dust you shall return. That's talking about the body. He's not a body, but this body was made from, you made this body from the dust. It returns to its, its, its original. You uh, originated from me, so from me, you, you're going to return. So once we leave the body, we return to God. That, that is without any contradiction, all right? So Jesus come with the truth. Remember, Jesus brings grace and truth, all right? So in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30, talking about a new covenant, a new rule, a, a new order of conduct, a new consciousness. He talks to us and he says this, Come to me, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Learn from me. If you're heavy, if you're having contradictions and hardships, and, and life is just not good, because the motivating thing that drives humanity uh, and all men, no matter what race, no matter what culture it is, is the avoidance of pain, all right? And, and, and you're attracted to pleasure. You want to be pleased and get pleasure as much as you possibly can and avoid pain at any cost, get pleasure at any cost. So if you're heavy laden and you're hitting these burdens and hardships and contradictions and, you, and life is tossing you to and fro, he says, well, if you're in that state, which is that curse that, that you read in Genesis, 
Well, I've come, come to me, come away from that. Come to me, learn of me, learn the wisdom, learn the understanding, learn the truth. And I'm going to give you, I'm going to exchange that hardship. I'm going to give you something that is uh, intended for you from the Father. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle. God, that means that he's gentle. God is gentle. He is the representative of his Father. If he is gentle, God is gentle. He's not angry. He's not upset. He is gentle and lowly in heart not boastful, not proud, not ego, not egoic, okay? And you will find what? Rest for your souls. The saving of your soul, you're going to find rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is like life is to be a blessing. Life is to be a blessing, not a curse. You can live. In fact, my personal point of view is that this earth is all the hell you're going to know. What can be more hellish than a, a coronavirus that is killing people and making them suffer? Or cancer, or wars, or blowing people? That is hell. So you don't want to let be overcome by evil, which means don't be overcome by hardships and contradictions, but overcome evil, the hardships and contradictions, with good. Be good. That, that's your driving point, to be good, to swallow this death up with your life with light. You have power and all you have to do is resist it. The Bible says for those, the devil in, in this case means the fallen mindset. Resist the fallen mindset. Give it no place. Give it no place. Always think with the higher mindset, the open and the larger mind. Think with that mind. Don't give the fallen mindset any place. Metanoa. Repentance. Change your mind. Change your perception. Change what you project from you to the world. Change it. To the pure, all things is pure. So th these things are over and over again. God just drives these things home. It's just so part of my fabric. They just come up very easily. And I know that they are part of your fabric as well. But they're inside of you. So hearing this word is going to evoke faith and power. You're going to have all you need to get through this time and be a blessing for those who are in your household. Amen. All right. It's been about 30 some nine minutes that we've been uh, talking to you. So we want to stop here. Uh, I'm going to have my, um, hopefully I'm going to have my grand, um, grandson put this back live <clears throat> on YouTube. For those of you who don't have Facebook, you can go to my YouTube address, which is Will We 3 Now this is live on Facebook. So you can always replay it on Facebook. You can listen to it now. You can go back and make your comments. Um, unfortunately, I don't have, I'm on Zoom and Facebook, so I don't, I'm not answering the comments. Hopefully somebody's answering comments for me. But you can uh, look on Facebook, make your comments, and um, I'll try to answer them <laughs> later on if we're not answering them live. Go to YouTube, that's Will We 3, later on today, and you'll see this rebroadcast. Now, for those of you who are supporting us, and I thank God for you, you can do that by making your mailbox your offering, the offering bucket, You're giving your tithes and your offerings. Uh, you can that uh, mail-in address, the mail-in your tithe offerings and gifts of love is uh, 2851, that's 2851 West, 120th Street Suite, S-T-E, period, E as in Edward, 522, uh, it's 2851. West 120th Street, Suite, S-T-E, period, our number, either one will work, uh, E as in Edward, 522, Hawthorne, California, and the zip code is 90250. Now, if you want to go to our website, which is www.nccfc.net, okay, www.nccfc.net. Net, and then you go to that website and hit donation. You can give a credit card or a debit card, and you can give your tithe offering a gift of love there. Now, um, those are the two places that you can give your gifts of love. Now, if you if those don't work for you, and you have Zilly Z E L L E, you can go to Zilly, and you can go to Sister Wheat at Yahoo.com, and then send your tithes and offerings there. 
and we will record your, your tithes and offering once you send it there. So those are the three mediums that we have to receive your tithes and offering. And before you even give, I want to I want to pray for you, and I want to thank God for you, and I want to bless you before we go off the air. So those.